this how we got a trip down the road. Make sure your party cup full up. Let's go! Welcome and thank you for joining us for this panel discussion this evening. Tonight's topic will surround reinventing the way we celebrate. This evening I'm joined with a star-studded panel for this conversation. Yes, Shannon, it's a star-studded panel. I am pleased to welcome you to the conversation this evening as we have conversations about reinventing the way we participate in carnivals, festivals and overall events. The entertainment industry, as we have known it, has embarked upon a few changes as a result of COVID-19. Not only has the way we participate in different events changed, our life as we know it now has to be adapted to what we consider a new normal. And the biggest question, how will that impact the way we celebrate our national carnivals, festivals and events? My name is Patrice Harris, and this evening I'm joined with a few persons who are critical, who have been heavily involved in carnival celebrations and events here in St. Kitts and Nevis, and I will allow them to introduce themselves, starting with the lady on my right. Hello, I am the chair of the National Carnival Committee, Shannon Hawley, and I am also joined by none other than... <laughs> All right, good evening. My name is Clement 
Monarch Ogaro, and <coughs> I'm a past chairman of um, Carnival 2010. And as um, Patrice said, we're definitely here tonight to see how um, to reinvent the way we celebrate not only Carnival, but other festival and events in um, St. Kitts Nevis. <laughs> Good night. My name is um, Raphael Rodney, and I am the promoter for the St. Kitts Nevis national event, in my opinion, the Cane Juice Cool Effect. And I am also the sole proprietor for Impel Logistics and Productions. Thank you for your introductions. As you would have noticed, we are going to be having conversations about carnivals, events. And I know the biggest question circulating right now will we be having a national carnival? I'm not sure if you're going to be able to get the response to that question in the way that you might want this evening, but I'm going to allow the chairperson of the National Carnival Committee to just give us a few introductory words. Thank you, Patrice. So the million dollar question is, as Patrice said early, earlier, can we reinvent the way we celebrate? As it stands now, of, as of today, what we are accustomed of doing is socializing as it relates to, to festivals and carnivals. COVID-19 has come and has put, as we say, a spoke in our wheel. And now we have to think about staying six feet apart. So it is the actual opposite of what we are accustomed of doing. We have seen over the past few months so many carnivals that have been cancelled. We have seen St. Martin, Antigua, Barbados, St. Lucia, Grenada, a host of carnivals that have been cancelled due to this pandemic. Now the fate of St. Kitts and Nevis, the fate of Trinidad and Tobago, Miami and Jamaica Carnival is on the table. Will these the few islands left in the region be able to actively host carnival as we know it. And of course, as I said before, that is the million dollar question. We've seen so many innova innovative ideas that have come about as a result of, of COVID-19. And event promoters, uh, carnival committees, etc., have done their utmost to ensure that participants, revelers, patrons have some level of satisfaction as it relates to uh, carnival or festivals. So the million dollar question and the question that we're going to try to answer or have some sort of discourse tonight is, are we able to reinvent the way that we uh, can celebrate? This is for us, this is a reality. We have some very tough decisions to make over the next few weeks. And, but this is ultimately the new reality that we have to face. COVID is going to be around for quite some time. It's going to be around, as, as Dr. Law said earlier, possibly for the next year and a half until a vaccine has, has, has come into place. But the health and the security of our federation the, the, the must come first. So these are things that we need to take into consideration. I think it's all good that if we have protocols in place, yes, I think that is fantastic. But we all know with a few drinks of alcohol and some music, we know that sometimes protocols may go out the window. So again, these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves realistically. How can we reinvent the wheel? How can we host some sort of festivities in the midst of a pandemic? And that's a very important question, Shannon. I think a lot of times when people think of events and carnivals and festivals, they're only thinking about the fetting component of it. They're only thinking about people going out and be able to have a good time. But I'm sure that all of us on this panel and many other persons are aware that there are many other benefits of hosting carnivals and events. And I know Mr. Rodney often speaks about the economic benefits of hosting carnivals and events. So, is there anyone who would like to speak a bit to that? What are some of the benefits of, of hosting different types of carnivals and events outside of just people going to jump up? Well, I believe Ogawa should start with this question because <laughs> wow, um, <laughs> Ogawa was a very instrumental element in terms of rebuilding what we what we, we now know as Sugar Mass, is it? Yes, sir. 
So before you even delve into that, I would like for us to hear from, from the man who invented the actual branding of what we now have um, entitled as Sugar Mass. Well, go going back to, um, to 2010, when we did the rebranding to um, <coughs> Sugar Mass, and Shannon was there um, with us as well as Deputy Chair, um, we, we had to basically reinvent um, the, the carnival and some of the events uh, as well. So that's where the Soka Monarch um, came on board in a big way. Um, we also introduced um, FETs as well in a big way, and that's where Inception and the, um, the forerunner to Cooler FET um, came on board um, that, that year um, as well. And, and so not only, um, as you say, the carnival is for the people who enjoy it and spend money um, in, the, the, in the bands um, for Juve or for the parade, but you're looking at vendors, not only at the carnival events, but at the, um, the private fets as well, um, that, you know, who make money. All the people who actually um, work to clean um, the streets, so the um, solid waste um, group. I mean, there's just a whole component of people that um, benefits from the carnival. And so, you know, though um, the coronavirus is um, seeming to, you know, that it's going to be with us forever um, or for the extended future, I mean, you know, I, I think that, um, of course, we're creative enough and we have enough of a creative reservoir in order to ensure that we could... Um, you know, do something this year so people can enjoy what I call the last carnival of the year. <laughs> <laughs> the last carnival of the year. <laughs> Just adding to what uh, Monarca said, carnival, St. Kitts and Nevis National Carnival is the largest national event on the calendar. Uh, it may not now be the most popular for some, but it is the largest event and it takes into consideration such a wide spectrum of stakeholders as you said Monat, from the vendors the many vendors street vendors vendors in events uh, multiple stakeholders event promoters uh, it takes into consideration you know individuals cleaning the streets right makeup artists individuals who do decor etc all of these individuals who have some part to play a national carnival uh, essentially will be affected um, in some way uh, over, the, over, the, over the season. So I think that these are some of the things that we need to take into consideration, uh, the economic impact of, of, of our national carnival. And, you know, sometimes we don't realize the extent. I mean, our national carnival s uh, spreads over a six-week period. I know back in the day for our 40th anniversary, we had 40, 40, 40, days for the 40, 40 days for the 40th anniversary. So our national carnival spreads over uh, six weeks or more. And during that six weeks, it's about individual so socializing, it's about tents, uh, carnival bands, soca artists preparing their music uh, for release. So the economic impact, I don't think we actually understand the, the actual economic impact of this, of this national celebration. Um, I don't think there has ever been an economic impact assessment as it relates to a national carnival because there's, but there's so many individuals who have to be taken into consideration when we make our decisions uh, as it relates to, to carnival and hosting of carnival. Well, I think it's very important not to understate the economic value of carnival, but to also try to highlight some of the social impact that it can have because you can imagine coming out of a or uh, being in a global health crisis where persons were in lockdown not able to go to some of the uh, biggest events music festival not being able to travel to other islands for carnivals how that can impact an, an individual psychologically and socially i remember being 
on the Virgin Islands Carnival Committee, and we had to host the carnival directly after Hurricanes Irma and Maria, two Cat 5 hurricanes. And so it was important to be able to have this event, to have it somewhat as a social and psychological way to lift people's moods and get persons to feel happy, to be, to be joyous and content again. So I think that's going to be an important factor that's going to play a role in the upcoming Carnival Sugar Mass at the end of the year. Because oftentimes the entertainment industry, sometimes I feel people frown on it. Apart from the economic benefits, you just outlined what we can see now is almost like a paradigm shift in the people that are interested in going out and hanging out and liming and even going to the beach. I've never seen so much people um, walking now. So everything that we feel would have been you know, taken for granted in the past. Now people look forward to entertainment more than ever, in my opinion. We couldn't wait for the movies to open. We couldn't wait for the beach bars to open. Right now on the beach, you have every weekend at least, I would say, 2,000 people on the beach, okay. right? And mm -hmm. that in it, and you're seeing a, a different depth. So you're seeing the younger ones, you're seeing the older ones. I mean, everybody have where they would go in terms of the enjoyment that they want to experience. But at the end of the day, even though you would have had a period of lockdown and some people not even having a job, the minute that sector started to open up, for everybody that was working, essential workers, they had a little bit of money saved up because they had nowhere to go. A lot of people ain't traveling again. So where there is a lack for some, there is excess for others, and these people can't wait to go out and spend. So when they go out and spend, now you have a, a waiter that now has a job, you have a bartender that has a job, you have a cook that has a job, right? Um, as Shannon said, you have you know, cleaners, you have the, the, the guys that remove garbage, because if the bars ain't open, ain't really no garbage there. So now the, the truck driver get back a job. And, and the list really goes on. People may often feel that the promoters are, are maybe carnival as the overall entities who's walking away as the winners. One of the things we try to do um, every year in the past couple of years, now that we're doing cool effects on a larger scale, is, is try to push the envelope and the, the limits to see how much more people we could get to come to St. Kitts. Over the past 10 years, we probably have invested about a million dollars and over half of that stayed in St. Kitts, but what went out was with the intention to get more to come in. So yeah, we might have hired popcorn and the price tag might have been higher. The people here wanted to see him and rightfully so, they deserve to see their favorite artists, right? And, uh, when we sent that money out to get popcorn here, for example, people flew in to see him, right? And not only that, when he posts that flyer on his Instagram page, then more people starting to see that there's a buzz happening in St. Kitts around December time, when most people would rather stay home. But believe it or not, people now want to travel and experience new things, right? So the, 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 the economic impact is very, very... I think um, underrated and sometimes I, I, I like that Shannon just said that we should probably have an assessment, um, have an analysis so that we could actually see where the economic impact is coming from, not just by demographic, but by um, the sectors, because you have the cosmetology, you have um, the decor, you have the entertainment, which is the musicians, you have the production which is all the guys in here who are dealing with the cameras and all of these things. You have the guys that operate the LED screens. The list is lighting, staging. The list is super long for the economic impact, right, that actually comes out of carnival, comes out of entertainment. Um, some may feel as if, I remember one time I read a review where someone felt as if we might have been forgetting with culture and moving too fast with modern carnival but I feel what we're doing is creating the perfect fusion and packaging it because it doesn't make sense to, inv to, to invest a million dollars in carnival just to celebrate with culture I mean we need to be able to justify spending that money spending that money should have some economic returns just like music festival I definitely um, I agree with that. And I know we were talking about stakeholders. I mean, as Fons was saying, um, people coming in, I mean, that of course impacts our hotel, car rental, um, you know, restaurants where people go out to eat and stuff like that. So, um, yes, I mean, I think it, it, the economic impact, uh, economic ass assessment after the carnival, I think would be something good because then it will tell us whether we need to spend more or it will tell us the whole story 
um, as to how we're benefiting and where we can actually improve. One of the things that we have seen throughout the region in carnivals, or festivals generally, uh, is that move away from the traditional element of carnival to more of a fetting, partying element. And these are the people who, who spend money. Um, the individuals who want to come in for the fits and the partying and individuals who, who spend the money. And so we're seeing the movement away from the traditional aspect. And I think what we're saying it is unique is that we have the opportunity to now fuse the two. Uh, we have the opportunity to have our traditional, hardcore, heritage-based uh, carnival activities uh, earlier in the month of December. And then we have that power week where we're able to host our fets and our uh, po pa uh, fets and parties and the Grand Parade, which is what attracts individuals from overseas. So I think that the intention of the new Carnival Committee is to fuse the two, ensure that our traditional aspects are well taken care of. Because I was listening to an interview a few nights ago with Banker. And when Banker used a word, healing, that healing word, that, that was very powerful. You know, it was a very powerful word. And it, it made me think of, you know, just that. You know, how do we dissect the, the carnival product? Look at ways where we may have fallen short in the past. Look at w ways in which we have excelled. Look at ways, look at where we want to be. Like, where does St. Kitts Nevis National Carnival want to be in the next five years? And do our utmost to ensure that that is possible. A lot of people around the region still are unaware of our national carnival. Even though it falls at an opportune time where you have New Year's, you know, just smack in the middle, just after of Christmas, you have the New Year's celebration and you can celebrate your New Year in St. Kitts. And I think what we need to do is, post-COVID, of course, we need to be able to dissect, reinvent the carnival product, and attract individuals from, from overseas. And last year especially, we've seen the troops, we've seen individuals like fonts, uh, and event promoters, Inception, etc. a number of event promoters, even the smaller event promoters. We've seen these are the individuals who truly marketed the National Carnival. We've, we saw uh, influencers fly in to be part of troops. We saw Cool Effect uh, hosting regional acts, celebrating our local acts. And I think that is, is critical. So we have to form that essential partnership between the event promoters, private sector, and, and the National Carnival Committee in order for us to, to excel. So we've spoken greatly about the amount of money that we would need to inject into hosting events to be able to see the returns, the return on investment, the ROI. But we're now at an era where we do not necessarily have the luxury of a large amount of resources to be able to invest into a carnival product. And that's why we're here to have a discussion about reinventing the way we celebrate, the way we fed, the way we have our national carnivals, and the way that we have our festivals. What in our mind does that really mean? Because to be honest, I'm gonna speak about myself personally, by the time we, we saw relaxation in regulations, I will tell you, I did not tune into a virtual event again. <laughs> For me, it was more about being on the streets, going to the bars, meeting up with my friends. So what exactly does reinvent mean for us in that regard? Why are you laughing after me, I Mr. Ogara? <laughs> I think we need to first, in terms of reinvention, we need to first look at where we are in terms of COVID-19, in terms of the pandemic. It's a very fluid situation. Where we are today might not be where we are next week. And this is like the frightening aspect of the pandemic. So if we were to say, let us host National Carnival today, I am sure that the NEOC would not have a major issue with us hosting it today. Because as we, as we know, there are there is no community spread as it relates to COVID-19. We, we understand that the cases are isolated, correct? Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny that you mentioned that, Shannon. Um, someone actually said that to me today. 
um, well, maybe we can pull the carnival forward but and I mean, not wait until... Other <laughs> factors. <laughs> other factors have to be taken into well, consideration. I, was, I mean, I know. I was just giving... Yeah. Um, no, but it's, it's the reality. But, but I think, though, um, the, the corona um, virus, is, it has caused us, as I said earlier, to dig deep into our creative reservoir. And, I mean, over the past couple of months, the, some of the stuff that we've done, um, most of it or all of it virtual, has showed that, I mean, you know, we have that capacity here in St. Kitts Nevis um, to do things that, I mean, you know, to, to challenge the rest of the region and the world. And so I think that, I mean, you know, something definitely can come of what we do um, this year definitely for um, Sugar Mass 2020, whether it's going to be um, virtual. Because every day now people are, just today, Grenada not only have canceled the carnival before, they've now canceled the two uh, Monday, Monday and Tuesday holidays as well, considering that people have been uh, locked no. down for so long. So, um, and, and, and Anguilla seem to be putting up a model as well too, because they have a one day um, festival where they, they have, I think, the juve in the morning, the boat rides and picnics and stuff during the day, and then entertainment at night. So, um, I, I mean, I guess just like how um, the country on a whole, we can look at and see what the region is doing as it relates to opening the borders and stuff like that. I'm sure we can take some, um, you know, some of what is going on in the region as well to ensure that, you know, whatever happens in December, um, definitely um, people would still have a good time. Well, I saw recently as well that in Antigua, Tian Winter, he usually, he usually has a t-shirt mass and he's now having a motor mass. And so you, it's basically like an island-wide island -wide motorcade. You go into your vehicle, they'll give you a FM station to tune into. You get your regular shirts. There, there are certain stops that you can use the restroom and enjoy entertainment. And then they're going to have people handing out food on the side of the road. And I read that quite intently, like, hmm, ingenuity, innovation. So what can we really see for St. Kitts and Nevis in terms of a carnival product? From a, even from a promoter's standpoint, how would you think about the reinvention of your particular event. What would you have to take into consideration for that to happen? And will there still be, that's my greatest question, as great of an interest and an appeal in a virtual event in December 2020? <laughs> 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 Fox just looked away at me, so I'm gonna look at someone. No, I mean, no, no, but <laughs> honestly, I, I really, at this point in time, based on the magnitude of the event that we have, I don't believe that we may be allowed to have so much people gathering. I mean, you're talking about over oh, five, 6,000 people. If that is to happen, then we may have to go into a venue that allows us to more or less double so the capacity. I mean, we always try to go in a bigger venue anyways, but realistically and ideally, there may not be any social distancing. And I'm not trying to go against the, 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 the grain in any way, but I would rather the border stay closed and we have a carnival inside than for it to open and then things get jeopardized. But the reality is we may just be open by that time. And in terms of virtual events, you know, as I'm glad uh, Patrice said it, the minute she was able to go outside, she was not interested in any more virtual anything. So would people tune in to a virtual event after a promoter would have invested in probably getting an artist to perform virtually? And uh, what, what would be the returns? I feel it, it's such a fluid situation, as Shannon said. I, can't, I, I haven't even started to think about how you know, I can really package what we're doing into um, a virtual event for Cool Effect. Right? If we were to ask the masses and the fans, and even when it comes to the other events, Glow Parade, Inception, Silent Night, Blue Fed, who am I missing? I don't want to forget nobody to get upset. Okay. Wet Fed. <laughs> but yeah, oh, with, all, with, all, with all these events now, so a promoter may be thinking to himself, like, yo, so how is this going to work out? It, should we cancel or should we not? In my opinion, if, if we were to probably get a think tank and filter it down to what because I believe a lot of good ideas out there. And, and, and this, is, this is basically a jump start to ignite 
you know, people's brains as to what they may be able to, 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 to accept or render force to try to do. However, you know, cane juice, we try to stay ahead in certain things that we do, and, and I guarantee you that if we have to make something happen for the people around that time, then we are going to do it, because in the absence of um, being able to go outside, we came up with, with, with vaccine. And vaccine was a virtual series. We included talk, entertainment, and um, even giveaways. Uh, so, so I could say for a fact that we, we would be able to do something um, and I would uh, encourage the other promoters to, to get the thinking juices on so that at least they could cater to their people as well. But in what capacity we, we would do it and in terms of the investment and the return on investment as Patrice was talking about earlier, you know, it's, it's, it's really left, left to be seen. I think the reality of the situation and we have to look at the worst case scenario because again, it's a fluid situation. If we look at it right now, we would realize that the regulations do not allow fits at this point in time. The regulations do not allow fits. So what you, can, what you may see on this strip or what you may see on Cockershell Beach on a Sunday, it is not considered to be a fit. So the, the regulations do not allow fits. If you look at places like St. Lucia, for instance, St. Lucia now has relaxed some of the regulations and are allowing fits up to 200 people. Mm -hmm. Barbados has relaxed some of their regulations and are allowing fits up to 500 people. Yeah. Now, the question is, are we going to relax the regulations? We don't know. And if you're looking at an event like Cane Juice or Inception that may have 2,000 people, how do you reinvent the celebration does the event promoter say okay well i'm not going to have one large scale event but i'm going to have a series of smaller events leading up to national carnival once you know possibly the regulations are relaxed i'm going to have a series of smaller events uh, 200 people per event uh, or whatever the regulations may state at that time and not have my massive 2500 uh, people uh, all at one time in a venue because you cannot social as Fon said there's absolutely no way you can social distance with 2500 people and i think that's a perfect point for us to take a break and so that when we come back we're going to have a conversation as to what does reinventing the, the fet world and fet life and carnivals look like we're going to take a short commercial break and we'll be right back with you for this evening's panel discussion <laughs>
Thank you for staying with us. My name is Patrice Harris and I'm the moderator for this evening's conversation about reinventing the way we celebrate. We've had several conversations and discussions earlier in this panel discussion about the National Carnival product, festivals, fets, events, and what does that mean now for us in a COVID-19 era? I'm joined with Ms. Shannon Hawley, Mr. Clement Monac Ogaro, and Mr. Raphael Franz Wadding. We're going to continue the conversation where we left off, where we were speaking about the need to reinvent the way that we celebrate. We've been looking at different models throughout the Caribbean region as it relates to the amount of persons that are allowed to congregate for fets. And we've been chuckling during the break as to how many persons we really believe will, will be allowed to have for a particular event in St. Kitts and Nevis. So who wants to start well, again? As I, before, <laughs> as I said before, this fluid situation, you know, if we knew six or eight months ago in December, if we knew that that would be potentially our last celebration until the unforeseeable future. You know, if someone had said that to us, we would have said no way. So we really have to, again, rely on those individuals, specifically in, in the NEOC, to determine at that point in time. And, you know, the preparations for Carnival don't start overnight. I mean, the preparations, we, we essentially are behind at this point in time. So we have to take into consideration that at this point, for instance, bands would have already, troops would have already started to prepare. Um, we have received notification verbally from about three of the larger troops to date that even if there were to be a road experience, they would not be in a position to participate as they would have in the past. They would not be participating simply because China was closed. Uh, you know, costumes would have had to be, be made, prototypes would have had to be made, feathers would have had to already started to be ordered. So this is reality of the situation and it forces us, I think with every challenge there is a silver lining. Mm -hmm. And I think this whole COVID-19 pandemic, it forces us to, as you would have said earlier, reflect and try to come up with ways we can reinvent. And one of the ways it, it, it has forced us to reflect is on the traditional aspects of Carnival. Again, I rely on Banker's presentation during his interview. And you know he, he appealed to the National Carnival Committee and the Ministry of Culture for assistance. And what is, he asked the question, what is the National Carnival Committee doing for the traditional folk, the individuals, the creatives, the artists who have been around for decades and have preserved the art form. How are we going to ensure that those uh, creatives are supported? So I think, again, in this whole pandemic period, it is an opportunity for us to support individuals uh, like Banker, support the individuals, the masqueraders, uh, you know, the clones, etc., who go above and beyond the call of duty to preserve the traditional elements of, of carnival because that as, that as well is very important. I know, you know, the, the influx and the finances of, of, of the, the day dictate that it is the younger individuals who want, as I said earlier, fit and experience the road who spend the most money. But there is that opportunity for us to refocus how can we, and refocus especially in time for the 50th anniversary next year, how can we look at ways to preserving our traditional aspects? And I'd like to hear more from uh, Monarch on that as well. Well, I know you mentioned the um, folklore. I'm going to go to um, Calypso. Um, and I know that um, you know, over the past couple of years, we've had um, challenges um, as it relates to um, you know, people um, attending the show. And I mean, I think that that's one of the, um, the focus um, that we can have for this year because, I mean, just looking at the way how the show is laid out, um, I'm thinking that, I mean, you know, social distancing for the band and the artists on stage uh, may not be too difficult of, um, you know, too difficult to, to achieve, but Again, it comes back to the question, how many people 
um, are going to be allowed um, to, to go in. But I think that um, Calypso, for sure, that's one of the areas that we'd probably need to, um, to, to focus on. And as you say, um, yeah, maybe, maybe this actually is the preparation for our um, 50th anniversary um, next year. Soka Monarch as well, um, which traditional um, big shows in all the other carnivals, um, I think that's another area of, um, of focus as well. And um, the social distancing, as I said, on stage would be, you know, okay. Um, so, I mean, these are some of the stuff that maybe um, we can, I mean, we can put on, whether it's in a virtual, um, you know, setting or um, a smaller audience um, so that, I mean, we could preserve some of these and maybe um, enhance um, what we've um, done over the past couple of years um, as well, because I think that it's easier um, for for the artists to do their music, considering some of the mu most of the music is done here. As a matter of fact, <coughs> I received um, uh, um, a recording from um, one of our soca artists here, based in New York, um, today. So there probably are people out there working on working on their stuff, um, you know, for for Carnival this year. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that we can, it would be interesting to, to, to um, you know, see how the traditional aspects of Carnival can be incorporated in a virtual um, state. And I think um, maybe Soka and, um, and Calypso um, would be, I mean, we can set the stage, as I say, for a massive competition um, next year, hopefully when COVID is not around and we have some more money so that um, the guys will be happy at the end of the day. Oh, sorry, Patrice. I recently saw today, I think, in Antigua, there is actually going to be a Soka Monarch yes, virtual. And the, the participants will present, will submit their, any song that they would have participated in before. before. Correct, correct. And then they would be judged. And then the, the finals, finals will be based, based mm -hmm. on songs. And I thought that was a, a, a great idea as well. So, I mean, I think what we are seeing in the other islands, uh, the same way we, we're seeing how other islands are opening and learning from their mistakes, I think that we can learn from other islands who would have had their carnivals over the next, would have had their carnivals and would have been preparing to host their carnivals over the next few weeks in, in terms of what they are doing and what they are allowing um, and then how it goes over when, it, when you know, the festivities have, um, have com been completed. So I think there is, as you said, Monarch, there is the opportunity to host virtual events. But the million dollar question again is, how do we feel about virtual events? Do virtual, event, virtual events where we don't feel the vibe, we're not able to feel the individual who is standing up next to us, the energy of that individual. If we have no choice, yes, but how funds would you host a cane juice event virtually? How, 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 how would you do it? I think that's a very interesting question for fans, being a, being a, but no, a business think, person, think, because this, he now has to not somewhat unveil his ideas, but to somewhat... <laughs> yes, I'm thinking about your intellectual property here, fans. But even before we go into the questions, I just want to let the listeners know than the viewers that you are able to WhatsApp any comments, any feedback, any input that you want to have into this conversation to 661-5183. 661-5183. Be kind, be polite, and uh, submit your <laughs> input to our discussion. So we're going back to France. I gave you some time to think, France. So what can we do? Now? It's back and all. There's no time to be polite. <laughs> no, in honesty, before we even jump to what um, cane juice could do because uh, Shannon just threw something out there and I will support it because people often feel like it's just the younger ones want to jump up and party and fet and all that. But that brings the money here. Well, you know what I mean? But the tradition, the culture, the art form, I mean, right now if we were to have a Calypso monarch, you could imagine that the topic would probably be politics and Corona. Mm -hmm. A lot of things that we experienced during this time. We had a an election during Corona. That in itself is, is hot sauce 
for uh, what do you call it? Social for social commentary, right? No, all isn't lost for cannibal. I mean, we kind of in a tight spot. The promoters, the, the mass bands, some of them can't do anything this year, right? Maybe they might be able to pull a little t-shirt mask together. But everything's co everything come down to the NEOC. Rather than us just throwing things up in the air, but we can't really answer how we're going to do it. I would like to render an idea to Shannon for um, the Calypso show or even the Miss Saint Kitts. Because as you said, the numbers have gone... <sighs> Almost non-existent. Many of trying to sound pretty eat up right now, right? The, it, it's it's hard that even when you combine all the carnival events that was, was was you know were hosted by the carnival committee, the fets doubling, tripling the numbers, right? You initiated a so commander that I feel was just on a crazy upward trajectory. As a matter of fact, during the peak at that time. We had decided, we meaning Cane Juice, we're going to put a pause on hiring foreign soccer artists and focus on our own. Stickle Drum Rhythm here, we ain't had no foreign soccer artists for about two, three, maybe two, about two or three years because we wanted to focus on our own. And then the, the artists them started to lose interest and then now you basically don't even have a soccer manark in my opinion. You, have the, you, you would have had the staging for it, but there was no participation. I would imagine now they want to come back and they're excited. So we, we don't know where we might be at, at that time, but let's say that the NAOC allows us to do small numbers. We may be able to get away with larger numbers if, one, the event is a sit-down event. So like for me saying kids and talented teen, we put the chairs a certain distance away from one another, temperature guns when you're coming in, sanitization, the whole nine yard, and we have, now the police force, they're there to ensure that we have a certain level of social distancing if you have to wear your mask. Ladies dress up for, for, for me saying kids, but they're gonna beat half of their face mm -hmm. to make sure that <laughs> to make sure that, you know, is a certain lashes. and the lashes them now be on. No make. lipstick, right? No, well it's not no point on the lipstick still. But at the end of the day, it's all about keeping that vibe of social distancing. If you get your temperature check when you're coming in and you're wearing your mask, more you you you're more or less following the protocols to a certain extent. When you get inside now, you know that the chair is going to be set up in a certain way. What is in the cricket stadium, more than likely has to be somewhere where you could have enough space to do it. So we still can have, I'm saying kids, in my opinion, once we follow certain guidelines that they have um, implemented. Um, for the Calypso show, I would, I, I would propose to Shannon to probably do a drive-in Calypso show, right? Where we take it on a big lawn, allow a certain amount of people in the cars, the motto... Is Tian Winter on your site? So they have regulations where uh, I think it's two people to two door, four people to four door, yeah. nine people to 14. So it's the same thing now. Yeah. You have a drive in Calypso show, uh, whichever one you choose to designate it to, you, 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 you have it come to on the FM dial, you have headphones, no one's saying it's wireless headphones, so you could get them to DJ Teva or myself, right? I'd put in a plug right there. <laughs> But um, you get headphones, you, get to, you, you probably got over 1,000, 1,500 headphones on Ireland right now. So there you have the opportunity to still have a Calypso show. You feed it to the headphones. So the Carnival Committee still have the opportunity to host some events surrounding the guidelines. Where we have some difficulties now is, is the FETs and, and, and trying to maintain, and the street events. Right? Be and, and the thing is, we really don't want to take away everything and make it virtual, not trying to stab anybody who's trying to do it that way, because if you do it all virtual, then the economic impact is going to disappear. Who's going to benefit from the virtual? Right? So the vendors, we have to think about them, you have to think about the artists, you have to think about the people that are setting up the stage. So right then and there, we are able to satisfy making sure that we have some economic um, stimulation, velocity, injection. These shows that are virtual, we can now stream it for the people that can't fly in and sell it at a premium. So some revenue is still being generated, and guess what? We now bring him back, the so not the Soka Manak, we now bring him back the Calypso show. You probably could bring back the Soka Manak, you could follow the same format. It's just there. You're going to sit down and you can't dance a bit. Yeah. I think that um, digital definitely does not replace that present experience, that in-present experience, um, present experience. So I think that, but it, it, it definitely enhances it because we reach 
a much wider audience. So someone in Trinidad, for instance, or you know, Antigua, who may not have followed our national carnival, may follow. They may say, well, let me, once we are able to advertise you know, a digital, virtual, well-produced event, then we can say, advertise with partners around the region. We're advertising with partners who, where you know, there's a heavy Kittishan presence, BVI, for instance. We advertise with partners in St. Martin and Willow. So we can then stream those events to individuals uh, through advertising in other territories, and you have that captive audience. So even for sponsors, for instance, you may sponsor a show, and you may not get that return on your investment in terms of sponsorship for that specific show. However, once it now becomes digital, you know, you have your advertising, etc., set up. So the sponsor is getting uh, a better, mileage. More, mi more mileage for that, for that captive audience. So uh, as Fawn said, I think these are the things that we definitely need to take into consideration, and we have been taken into consideration. You know, what events do we think uh, as a National Carnival Committee can be actually hosted where there is some sort of physical presence, but still have that very well-produced uh, digital element. And we've been speaking with individuals who have, for instance, you, you, you just saw a whole virtual campaign. Uh, the whole election was hosted virtually, and that was uh, produced all locally. So it's, there is nothing barring us from doing the same. Now, one thing that we haven't touched on is finances and the financial aspect of it as it relates to you know, whether we have the money to host a national carnival. And again, we have to look at, you know, we've heard about before, you know, a certain amount that has been allocated in the budget. But there's, as I said before, no way that that allocation, or half of it, or quarter possibly, will trickle down to National Carnival, uh, taking into consideration the serious uh, situation as it relates to individuals who are out of jobs, um, individuals who are re receiving extended subventions from government, um, the hotel and tourism industry that is at right now at a standstill. So these are the considerations, these are the things that we need to take into consideration. So not only from a health perspective, but from a financial perspective, what are the main or key events do we think, um, and again, reaching out to stakeholders, what key events do you think uh, can be or should be hosted uh, during a festival uh, uh, period? Well, I think as you, there's so many things I want to touch on, but as you spoke about the financial component of funding a national carnival, yes, a significant portion of the money comes from the consolidated fund from the government. But we have to recognize that sponsorship is also a great source of funding for carnival events and a national carnival, fringe events, private events, etc. But then, the, as you would have mentioned earlier, there isn't an excess right now. You would recognize that some companies are in, uh, having moratoriums, the, some companies are laying off their employees, so they don't necessarily have the typical twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to invest in a national carnival product. So that subtracts from the amount of money that is available to overall host these, these events. As it relates to the conversation about virtual events, we keep mentioning about having a virtual political campaign, and I don't tend to agree. I believe that, yes, while, our, while a lot of the meetings were virtual, there was still a very large physical component of the political campaign that allowed it to be as successful as it was able to be. When we think about uh, virtual events again, we have to recognize that People go to events for a vibe. There are some people, for example, I manage Rukas, and sometimes I'll ask people, so what do you think about Rukas' performance? And they're like, oh, you perform? Because they're just at the back, they're by the bar, they're having a great time. So it's not so much about what's happening on the screen. So you might very well find that a person who might go up to Warner Park to attend a cooler event might not look at a cooler event virtually because they very much would prefer to go down by the ferry terminal. <laughs> Patrice is determined, <laughs> she's determined to get out of her. No, but I'm, I'm trying to, to really bring the realistic conversation and the balance as to 
the virtual events. Yeah, and, and I, I certainly understand that, but I mean, I think that we've had some ideas. I, I like the, the motto event for but probably a, a soca monarch or something like that. Hey, listen, if you like what you hear, you toot your horn. <laughs> 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 that's audience, that's yeah. that, exactly. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's audience different. participation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we need, of course, and it's about sensitizing the public. Mm -hmm. And I think we do realize, the public does realize, this is not, we're not in normal times. This is the new normal. We don't know how long it will last. We don't know if it's six more months, a year, year and a half. This is the new normal. Sure. So this is the reality. So we cannot, you know, say, unless, as Fonz would have suggested earlier, you know, keep the, keep the borders closed. But again, keeping the borders closed for our own selfish, you know, <laughs> reasons. You know, the, the reality is that at some point the borders will reopen. And once the borders reopen, we have to think worst case scenario. And I think we have to be responsible when planning to think worst case scenario. Because we've seen, you know, what has happened in other islands. And it doesn't mean that St. Kitts is special and it will not happen here. I mean, to this point, the health officials, the security forces, the government of St. Kitts and Nevis has brought us so far successful, successfully to this point. So we don't want to be irresponsible and mess it up for anybody because we see the impact of COVID uh, throughout the world. Okay, so let's just say, and this is my creative juice is going again now, right? At that time, the, the, the borders are open. Are we still practicing quarantining? So, f so for, the, so for the, the, the countries that would have reopened, um, the guests, I think they are confined to the hotel, right? They can't leave the hotel, or some of them allow them to leave the hotel. We really don't know. So if it is that we open, it really comes down to the guidelines that they, they really give us to operate by, right? Because let's say they say, okay, we're going to allow you to open the borders, that is and guests have to stay at the hotel for the entire duration of this you you know while they're here right so mm -hmm. returning nationals would have to quarantine somewhere wherever they're quarantining they're going to have to be the virtual audience and the question is are they coming home to stay quarantined or are they coming home for carnival so even if the borders open and we're having a carnival that don't mean that we're going to have a large influx of people right this might seem crazy, maybe even prejudice, but, but if it is that you're supposed to be confined to the hotel, then you're going to have to enjoy the events virtually. And I don't feel that the residents and people that have been here and, and enjoying a, a COVID-free lifestyle should have to be confined to their homes in order to enjoy. Like, well, how are you going to do it? They're going to go strip on a Friday, but <laughs> they can't go to a fete. The Saturday, but there's some. I guess some islands have a protocol of having people um, test before they get to um, their destination, and, and then when test they when there. they get to the destination. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I'm not. But it's not full. It's not a hundred percent. Correct. You know, Correct. foolproof. You know, there may be that just you one test. individual. You've seen individuals, one person affect. 700 people. Exactly. Uh, so these are the things. This is the reality of the situation. This is the reality that we have to face. Uh, Fon, sorry, you mentioned about um, individuals wanting to go out. Again, we have to take into consideration, do, once the borders open up, or if the borders open up prior to carnival, will we go as a people lockdown. go, well, no, maybe not go back in lockdown, but will, how comfortable will we be in going out? Uh, will we say, regardless, the borders open, we have 100 cases, but we're still going out? So that is another thing that we need to take into consideration. People going out, regardless. I feel like we, we, we just recorded well, another case. We two more cases recently. Mm -hmm. But we, we were happy and, and felt safe knowing that these people are quarantined. Because the cases were isolated. And so we, they were isolated cases. The, the cases, we, we realize it. But in the minute that we have one case that may have gone out into you know community spread mm -hmm. then we have to take that on a whole different <coughs> level and i for one you know back in march i was locked to my tv i would not miss a uh, uh, any OC briefing. <laughs> now you ask me when last have you looked Shall at is now confessing. <laughs> no, but you could ask me when last have you looked at an NEOC briefing. These are the briefings that I was the one, one of them, lobbying. I yes, lobbied. Yes. We are the briefings. Why can't we do like Trinidad? 
the briefings have still four or five months later continued. And how many of us can honestly say, we look at these briefings daily? I watched watch the one today. Okay. <laughs> but Patrick, you said we all say that. So, so mm -hmm. you know, we're actually now living a bit normal. Like, we got, we got to wear the mask. We know that we have to practice a, so, a certain level of social distancing. But at the end of the day, our people have already gone back to a level of normalcy. If who should have been here tonight with us, I feel like unfortunately maybe next time we could have them, somebody from the NEOC, so that we could just punch questions at them and they could tell us realistically what it is we may have to do and we could give them ideas on the fly. Because I hear thinking about maybe a national ID card to say, well, I've been here for the last how much ever months and I have a card that allows me to be outside. But if you, if you come in and you're supposed to be quarantined, you don't have this card, so you can't access an event venue that only allows a certain amount of people, right? So you, regardless of where you decide to go, if you're going to go into a large um, event, let's say they allow up to 2,000 people in a, cap, in a space where it could fit 5,000 people, when you're going inside, you get your temperatures checked and all of these things. You cannot enter regardless unless you have this card that says you are allowed you know, but then again, you know, if you were exposed to somebody... Committee. There's, there's, right. there's a flip side to it because I think people are as comfortable as they are now because the borders are closed. Exactly. There's exactly. a high level of assurance like, exactly. look, Dr. Laws, Dr. Okay. Wilkerson, Abdis, they got this. I yes. could comfortably go out on the street and do whatever I need to do, exactly. participate in social events. Exactly. But from the time the borders be open, I, exactly. I think there might be a higher level of paranoia. Absolutely. I People are going to be like, oh, you come from Taiwan, you come from Taiwan, you come from Taiwan, and they're not going to want to interact and be as social as they are now. So I think we have to really take into consideration what then is the next scenario when borders be open? How then do we celebrate? How then do we have a festival? How then do we congregate when borders are reopened? Yeah, I think just to, to, to clarify, the National Carnival Committee has had a few meetings already with the uh, NEOC. And as I said before, the situation is fluid. The NEOC is only able to advise as of now what the situation is. They cannot say to us, okay, well, Carnival, you go ahead and plan because you know, we know that we're gonna have zero cases and we're gonna be all safe. The, the financial economic uh, side of things is that the hotels are closed, uh, borders, are, borders need to reopen. We need to get that trickle in. But the reali reality is how many people are going to come to St. Kitts from the hot spots? I mean, we heard earlier the United States is our, our lead market, with accounting for over 80% of individuals flying into St. Kitts. How many individuals are, are we going to allow individuals from the U.S. to fly in? Do we say no? U.S. Uh, passengers until 2021. We actually Some don't. Countries are doing exactly. It right now. We don't know. We've seen Bahamas, of for course. instance. We've seen Bahamas close off, saying no more, no more Americans. We see Saint Vincent saying uh, we're about to close to the U.S. So are we going to follow their lead and say, okay, well, you know, you know, if you come in from the U.S., thank you. You know, you know who in stay in, as 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 people say. I, I think I think we should take the bold step considering you know what it is um, at the end of the day as much as we want to reopen borders because we feel as if we're missing out on revenue we still have to think about the country safety because you open the borders and then you you have a um, an influx of people that may bring in something when we're just in, enjoying a level of just relief and all of these things so we have to wait like when we open the borders so much people can actually come right and don't get me wrong. I believe that people will start coming, but we really need to put it out there where we are, where are, we are allowing people from to begin with. Um, first of all, we need to refocus who our target market actually is. Because can be thinking about the U.S. right now. Inter-Caribbean travel is very, very, to me, underestimated. We need to tap into it. Yeah. And now more than ever, we should be looking at um, okay, this port is COVID free, that port is COVID free, they have been COVID free for the past three, four months. We should be able to open to these people because as long as they're keeping their borders, we have to be on the same page. So if we're not accepting Americans, 
they can't accept Americans either. This is not us being prejudiced. This is just us being, you know, honest and true within ourselves to know that this market that is typically our target market is not where we can accept people from at the moment, right? So Angola is good. St. Martin is good. The VA is good. Guess what? All of us could start trading amongst ourselves. Because from time the borders open, if nothing, matter of fact, I would love to go to Pokemon in Angola. Oh, well, no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna uh, not to, to cut you off, but we're gonna pause for a short commercial break, and we'll come right back into who and where should we accept persons from hypothetically when borders be open, so that we can have uh, events, carnivals, festivals, fets. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Go on, Leo! Go on! Thank you for staying with us. We've been having a panel discussion surrounding the conversation, can we reinvent the way we celebrate? Before we had our commercial break, Mr. Rodney was given a bit of his radical ideas as to where we should accept persons from in the era of COVID-19 if we were to have events. But Mr. Rodney, before you go back in, I have a person, someone who sent me a WhatsApp saying, I'm a U.S. citizen and I'm also a Senkid citizen. So how are you going to be able to restrict and deny me from returning to Senkid Amoebas for carnival? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that person there probably coming from my neck. I'm not trying to be prejudiced, like I said. The reality is, okay, so my mom lives in Florida. I used to travel to my mom very often. I can't even go there now. Right? If my mom is to say she wants to come back, mommy, you're coming from a hotspot. That's just the reality. And that's my mother. Right? Um, it really depends on where you're flying from in the U.S., but then if, let's say you fly from Miami to go to Texas to come here, you're still coming in from a hot spot. Right? Be, as it stands, we can't deny nationals from coming home. So you're going to come home, you're going to go to the charter system, you could still come home. We're not saying that you can't, but in terms of a commercial flight, that is what would more than likely be denied. Now, if you come through on the way that people are coming in now, which is through the charters, 
you're going to be subject to a quarantine. And once you go to that um, protocol and the steps, you're free. You got your pass to come outside just like everybody else. But in terms of coming in for the short stay, or you're coming in for the week period and you're coming in from a hot spot, you really need to plan your vacation if you want to because you're going to have to come in on a charter. So people in, I mean, Canada, the, 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 the numbers in Canada have started to dwindle because they, they have been managing it well. Um, unfortunately, Donald Trump has not managed it the way that others have, including our very own tiny paradise island of St. Kitts. So the, the, we really need to just be cognizant of the fear factor and also the reality of what the virus can do to our, to our healthcare system. But the question then remains, how realistic would it be to subject certain islands or persons who are living in certain islands to not be able to return? Because if you look at places like the United States Virgin Islands with a very, very large St. Kitts Nevis Stars for a very large population, they come home, they participate in carnival, and they have about 150 plus cases at the moment. And that is, that is a spike that we've seen in recent times. If you look at places like Puerto Rico and St. Martin, I'm not, I'm not really familiar with the exact numbers at the moment, but these are hubs that people use to get into St. Kitts, particularly around carnival time. They find the cheapest flights, it's easy to get to Puerto Rico, it's easy to get to St. Martin, but these are hubs. And these hubs also mean that these are places where the virus can be spread realistically. So is it a fair assumption to really say that there are some places that we should disallow persons from when we, we're thinking about carnival in a COVID era? Other islands, other islands right now have created this bubble, travel bubble. And if you look at Southern Islands, for instance, I think St. Lucia, for instance, St. Lucia now allows individuals from around the region, from around the OECS, in, in islands that there are low, low, what they call low risk islands. And so they are allowing individuals in from islands and not having them test, but allowing them in, no quarantine, uh, I think one test or no test, and they're allowed in. So I think that the authorities need to look at examples that have been set by the other islands. Is it working for St. Lucia? Uh, is, are there, you know, the active cases increasing rapidly? So these are the things that I think that the authorities need to look at for the rest of the year. The first six months of the year have gone by in a blink of an eye. And, you know, it, December it will be upon us. So the reality is how many, as Fawn said, how many individuals will be, come, once we open, how many individuals will actually be coming in from the hotspots, want to leave the hotspots with the fear of maybe not being able to return to, to those hotspots, and whether the NEOC and the authorities will require individuals coming in to quarantine during that time? Because if in December the same quarantine uh, rules apply, then individuals will have to come in and then quarantine for two weeks, whether it's in their homes, or hotel rooms, etc and then the, the, the risk will be less of the spread. The risk of spreading corona will be less than it is if our world is open but without any quarantine. Just to, um, be, before you get to your, um, <laughs> your next um, WhatsApp message, um, Patrice, just to add to, uh, maybe to support some of what um, Fan said, hey, um, New York is now quarantining people that come, that's coming from the hot spots like Miami and um, Houston so texas and um florida as well because so i mean if they can do it to their own nationals in the u.s i i don't see why you know we can't do it some people might say well you know hey yeah i mean you know you can't do that because i'm a national i'm coming home but then you'd have to whatever the protocol is when you come in you'd have to adhere to it um just so that i mean you know we we don't have that fear of being out in the public with someone who could possibly spread. Okay, we have been soliciting the comments and feedback from our listeners and our viewers as well. Fan, someone has sent you an idea. Perhaps you can have three nights of cooler fits, 500 per night. We can also, for, for yourself, Miss Holly, we can also have a steel pan competition that can happen in town. We wear a mask like we usually do. Persons are asking about regulations for a boat ride. What seems to be a trending topic on Facebook at the moment is whether or not we should actually have a carnival. Persons are suggesting that it should be 
delayed until next year for the 50th year have a grand carnival celebration it is not a normal year the monies should actually be, go towards some of the social issues that are taking place in the country persons think that it's very selfish to not have the borders reopened we have thousands of persons who are out of work and the borders need to be reopened and we just have to learn how to live with COVID-19. Someone is saying the virtual just doesn't do it. Yes, I'm rocking with you. The virtual <laughs> does just doesn't do it. It's played out and these shows would be sad indeed. I don't know if contestants are looking, but they're asking, is there going to be a reinvention of the carnival shows, the GQ and the Miss Sinkits and the swimsuit competition? I think we spoke, uh, I spoke on the weekend about the reinvention of national carnival shows. As Franz mentioned earlier, we've seen over the past few years a dwindling uh, in terms of participation in the, in the national carnival events, mainly the shows. And one of the ways, and it was an, a suggestion uh, that was given by the public, and I tend to agree with, one of the ways in which we can ensure that crowd participation is increased is by shifting the National Carnival shows out of that power week. There should be absolutely no reason why National Carnival events like a talented teen or queen show, Calypso show, should be competing with a cooler fit. I think that we need to, we have enough space on the Carnival calendar to be able to host both of the events uh, on, you know, both of these types of events on, on different dates. So there is a power week and the power week would have all the fits and the road experiences. Prior to that power week, we will have events that focus mainly on the local market. We have events such as the shows, uh, we have Bass There Alive, events surrounding the traditional aspects of, of Carnival. And, and to answer that question about uh, panorama or a pan competition, that is something that we definitely are looking at. Uh, the possibility of hosting this year and getting all of the bands uh, on board with us to host a successful event because these are the traditional aspects of carnival that we can concentrate on even if we don't have that traditional carnival uh, there are aspects of the carnival that we can have some presence you know a limited amount of individuals participating uh, and we can still have that virtual experience which is uh, again I can't stress enough a well-produced a virtual event uh, supported by that, um, pre that presence that is limited based on the numbers that the, the task force would, would give us. I think one of the, the misconstrued notions as well is the, is the whole idea of the virtual event because realistically, why are you chuckling, Monaco? It's not because of my, of my <laughs> opinion of it, but realistically, most events that have been taking place in the last few years have had a virtual component. The shows were streamed. If the, it's, just, it's just a newer media that now has a greater appeal, so to speak. You see more persons on social media. You see more persons on Instagram, on Facebook. So naturally, you will have more viewers. But you still would have already had the typical medias mediums. You still would have had the shows being aired on radio. You still would have had the pay-per-view in terms of the shows being in the in the pack. So it's not so much about the virtual component and we love the virtual event, but the, at the end of the day, it is the appeal of the event, at least in my estimation. It is the overall appeal of the event that will allow it to attract the numbers. In terms of hosting the events, as would have mentioned earlier, it's, it's quite easy to do that because you can space out the chairs as we saw with the inauguration. You can do all of these things, but how then do we ensure? It's about striking the balance now. How do you satisfy the needs of the persons who physically want to be there and not compromise the product, or the product itself and the health and the safety of the, of the citizens of the nation? And that's, I mean, that's difficult in, in, in the sense that, I think Shannon mentioned this earlier, that for Carnival this year, we're, we're behind already. I mean, we're almost at the end of July, and so I'll, I'm sure a lot of planning would have, in normal years, a lot of planning would have gone into, um, you know, putting everything together for, um, for, say for instance, mass, even some of the, um, the soca artists. 
as well. So, um, I mean, I, I hear you, um, Patrice. I think that, you know, a balance would be, would be nice. And I think that balance would come from um, maybe utilizing this year um, to bring back to bring back, um, you know, the, the, the bacchanal that we used to have when it comes to Calypso and Soka Monarch, even um, for uh, Miss St. Kitts, um, bring back um, the, you know, the, the, the people to that show because I think we can do a good job of social distancing um, when it comes to stuff like that. And I don't know, maybe, you know, as I said, be a good setup for our 50th anniversary next year. Again, you know, this year I think the focus again should be on the solid investment or support of the National Carnival stakeholders. Stakeholders that have contributed to National Carnival's uh, the preservation and stakeholders that have will co uh, are contributing to the evolution of National Carnival. And I think that is, that is very, very important. And I think we also have to look at ways of, as a National Carnival Committee to, when, when I say support, we have to, to assist, you know, whether it's a, a Calypsonian or uh, someone individual, individual uh, in the art form, whatever art form, we have to be able to assist those individuals by enhancing the product, enhancing what they have on offer. Because you know, what we're seeing now is we have bands bringing out songs in the middle of carnival, right? So we have to look at ways in which we can support, for instance, a soca artist or a, an, an, or a band and, and incentivize them. Because we, we, we need to be able to say, okay, well, bring out a song. Let us assist you in producing a video. You understand? And, and these are the kind of things that I think we need to do in order to ensure that our carnival grows because a carnival is only as great as the people who participate in it. And so these are the things that as a national carnival committee, we need to step back and look at and say, how can we support these artists? Are these artists only bringing out songs for national carnival? How can we get their music out there? How can we get their music out there to the region internationally, like we're seeing in, in, in the different islands? What are we doing wrong? Or what can we build on to ensure uh, the, National Carnival the National Carnival is out there as a national celebration, just as we see so many other carnivals? I mean, Jamaica only recently established a carnival, and their carnival is now it's so yeah. big, it's huge. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, not to men uh, we want to be known as the number one small island carnival. We, we are doing what we have to do internally, but we need to be able to partner yes. with other uh, ministries. We need to be able to partner with the Ministry of Tourism. We need to be able to say, you know, Ministry of Tourism, how can you assist us? You know, not just advertising National Carnival in a booklet or online or whatever, but how can you, if you look at other islands, the Ministry of Tourism heavily is involved in the promotion of their carnival. How can the, the new Ministry of Arts and Entertainment assist us as a National Carnival Committee and the Department of Culture, Ministry of Culture, uh, how can they assist us in getting our product out there? So these are the things I think, as I said, there's a silver lining behind every dark cloud. And these are the things that we can look at, and we have a whole year to look at uh, leading up to the 50th anniversary. Partnering, partnering with key ministries, as I said, the Ministry of Tourism, the Skipper, the Senkis Investment Promotion Agency. National Carnival has to be looked at the same way that Music Festival is looked at. And I think, I, I, I hope I'm not um, stepping on anybody's toes, but I do not think Step. that at this point that our National Carnival product, even though it is the largest national event, is looked at the same way that our music festival is looked at. And, and, and I, I agree with you. I mean, we had so many people last year, just, just looking at last year, for the FETs, for the mass. People are now coming in from places that we wouldn't even think or consider um, are coming to St. Kitts. So we have to definitely start looking at, at um, Carnival as a tourism product as well. Um, Shannon, you mentioned something very, very important, and I guess I can say dear to my heart, in terms of the Carnival Committee helping 
um, assisting and working with um, the product that we have, um, enhancing it so that we can take it to the region, we can take it to the world. Um, because as someone who has lived in different cities um, around the world, I mean, it's hard when you go to a fete and you're hearing everybody else's music except, except our music. And it's not, that, it's not for a lack of, I mean, you know, not having good music. I mean, fans went back to 2015, stick a rhythm. I mean, come on, everybody wanted that rhythm. So um, I think that the time has come now um, for um, all the stakeholders, as you said, different ministries. I mean, we saw what the Virgin Islands did at Miami Carnival, um, I think it was last year when they had Pumper, and they were advertising their, their brand as well, too. So, Uber is Correct. one of the sponsors. Correct. I mean, and I, un I understand that. I mean, come on, look at the Uber Soka Cruise. There were more Ketishan Senkits Nevis flags on there than any other island. That means our people, our people are out there wanting to fed. Yeah, um, Patrice Roberts, she has a, a video for a song called I See You. And every 10 seconds or 15 seconds in that video, you see a Senkits Nevis flag. So um, we're out there, and I think that if we enhance our, um, our product, um, I think would it would be definitely good for us. One way, one way to do that as well to um, encourage Soka Monarch as well is we have to get somebody in the finals of the international Soka Monarch in in, in um, Trinidad. I know we've tried. We tried back when we um, when we when we in 2010 when um, <coughs> Conris I think was the the, the winner. Um, so I think I mean these are things that we definitely need to do to get that we need to make mm -hmm. in order for you know it's just not about carnival six weeks a year it is about investing in our participants our stakeholders to ensure that they get out there they promote their product because in promoting their product they're promoting the island they're promoting St. Kitts, they're promoting our national carnival and we need to see more of that you know um let me just have a quick chime in here just just sitting here and listening to this discussion is heartwarming for me, especially to hear you say it. I mean, I've, I've heard you say it in the past, but now you're saying it to whoever is watching, wherever they're watching from. Carnival is a tourism product. Shannon just said something that is music to my ears, and somebody texted me about it and said, finally, you have our carnival in the past, especially as a stakeholder, it felt like we're competing with carnival when it should really be that we're working together. Because believe it or not, Promoters work behind the scenes together during Carnival to, to just get our events aligned so that it is more attractive to a person that is traveling in. So, for example, you have the, the Cool Effect Weekend, you have the Inception Weekend. Around the Cool Effect Weekend, you get Sokom and Hack, you get Wet Fet, you get um, Cool Effect, and you also get Juve. Then you get Christmas Eve too, right? Then th the following weekend, you have the All Inclusive Fet, you have mass on the road you have all year's night events fireworks and all of that if you're lucky enough to be here for that entire period you've basically just enjoyed a chunk of what sugar mass is but this is the power week before that you have the events that would cater to more or less a domestic crowd because the person coming from Antigua who's interested in St. Kitts Carnival, they don't know Patrice from Kayon who is participating in, in a pageant right but these pageants have lost the luster the attraction and all of these things and i would love for shannon to even inject a fashion aspect to 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 miss saying kids when i used to go to miss saying kids it was a stush event right so now we're gonna bring it back put put a red carpet outside then and make it not just about who's on stage but also who's attending the event Right? So now you have Miss St. Kitts slash the Red Carpet event. Right then and there, I guarantee you may get an additional 2,500 Absolutely. people. Absolutely. And I think, well, I've heard comments about how stush I am. So, <laughs> um, well, then <laughs> we should know. But that has been something that I've been, I'm not. I am not, but I've heard it. I am not. <laughs> I am not. But, but what I'm saying is absolutely fun. I, I, you know, that's what we have been discussing as a committee. Like, how do we bring back? Back in the day, people three months prior to Miss Saint Kitts were planning their, their wardrobes, yeah. right? Yeah. So 
and not only bring back the I mean it all is is also about the individuals who want to participate in missing kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to get the best of the best. We have been getting, but we still we need to continue and build on on that and get the best of the best. Attractive um attractive prizes, you know, mm -hmm. to, to get the best of the best for these shows. So I don't think is that I wasn't getting the best of the best. It's just that people want to be a part of something yes, that is big, yes, that is looking successful. successful. Ex exactly. You just touch on something saying the prizes. Yeah. I guarantee you if you were giving away a 5,000 square foot of land as part exactly. of the, 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 the winning from a St. Kitts, mm -hmm. you're going to get people to sign up fast. Oh. If you're giving away scholarships, yeah. 25, I mean, it, it could be a, a combination of cash and kind so that whoever the queen is, she know, look, I walk away with a piece of land, I walk away with some cash in the pocket and a scholarship to go to school. Patrice, you were saying something. I actually want to pause for a break. <laughs> I really don't want our producers to get angry. I just want us to pause for a break and we're going to come back and speak about, because this is a very good conversation, how can we really increase and improve the caliber of the carnival shows, the shows that are hosted by the carnival committee. We'll take a small commercial break and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. <laughs> Start the monarch. Start, start the monarch. Fenty. Make we party. Fenty. Hey, hey. In rain or in sun, yeah. Once the band them strike up, we running, coming down, yeah. Trouble in the town, yeah. We drinking, we rum. On the grass, we walk with them, yeah, let to the ground. It's trouble in town, yeah. Me I live for you. Me I live for me and my boo. Sexy Malabu Hey! So make we do what we do, what we do, what we do, what we do yeah. And I see now it's 3 plus 2 No! Everybody! No! So if you see me really getting on in a bike Hey! Hey! And if you see me waist getting on like a ass See no press can tell your mother is mine Me and live my life is only one Because when you get to know you done huh. So if you see me when you get in on in a bar And if you see me when you get in on like a ass See no question, tell your mother is mine Me I live my life is only one because when you get in on That is the ghost style, yeah Once the rum and music humble me like a child, yeah Pull up for the oil, yeah Girls getting on wild On the glass we walk to them, girl, them What we say? Let me go! Me not live for you Me only for me and my boo Hey, sexy Malabu No, oh. so make me do what we do, what we do, what we do, what we do And I see now we see plus two Hey, see me coming through Mash up to one oak and find me crew So if you see me really getting on in a bag And if you see me waist getting on like a ass We don't rest on Tell your mother is what Me and live my life is only one Because when you get to know you done huh. So if you see me really getting on in like a tongue, 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 a tongue. Hey. Like a ass, no Tell your mother is what Me and live my life is only one Because when you get to know you done huh. So if you see me really Thank you for staying with us. You have been tuned into a panel discussion where we will be having a conversation about reinventing the way we celebrate. Before we paused for our commercial break, we were having a conversation as to how we can improve the events organized by the National Carnival Committee. I just want to put the disclaimer out there that the conversations that we're having now and the improvements that we are proposing might not necessarily be for the upcoming carnival that could potentially be held this year. But definitely for future years, especially for the 50th anniversary celebration of Carnival. And in the break, as we saw clips of the Soka Monarch competition, we were having conversations as to how we feel as though that show can be improved. And so I know Monarch was speaking quite passionately about the improvement of the Soka Monarch product and what he thinks, in a, very briefly, can be done. I mean, I, I just think that, first of all, we need to find a way to encourage a lot of the acts that was part of the show before 
um, to, to re-enter. Because we need people who, who have fans. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything against the guys who've entered now, because everybody will still have a, an opportunity um, to, to enter. Now, I listened to a conversation a couple weeks ago and there was a um, lead singer of one of the bands here who think that if the lead singers from the bands go into the Soka Monarch, that the other people are going to be at, at, at a disadvantage. Now, I don't believe that that's the case at all. I think if, I think if they go in, <laughs> exactly, I think that they, they would enhance um, the, the product. And one of the enhancements, I think, is incentives. I mean, right now, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the top price in the Soka Monarch is $10,000. So as you say, Patrice, you work with Rukas. You spend $9,000, so you're not taking home anything. What are you going to invest to be better for the following year? I went to Trinidad one time for the Calypso tent, and I learned a lesson. And it was kind of stupid when the person told me this, but singing in the Calypso tent, and um, the, my handler in Trinidad said to me, look, next weekend, you're going to see people um, dress better. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you know what? They get paid for singing that first week. So now they invest in looking better and doing better for um, the, 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 the next week. And I think that that's definitely where we need to go. Once guys know that there is um, some kind of financial incentive to, to enter the show, um, or at the end of the show, they're going to enter, and we're eventually going to get that person in Trinidad for, our, uh, for the, Soka, um, the International Soka Monarch, so we can see the St. Kitts Nevis flag flying in the stadium as well. But for me, the conversation, I'm going to be devil's advocate here. Should it really be the responsibility of the Carnival Committee to incentivize and to try to get persons to re-enter into the Soka Monarch competition? If it is that you're really passionate about what you do and you see yourself on a career path, mm -hmm. to be a Soka artist, to be a dancehall artist, to be a reggae artist, should someone really be running behind you with an incentive? The greater conversation that needs to be had is how we perceive the music and entertainment industry in St. Kitts and Nevis. That's why we consider the Carnival product as a one-dimensional product. We don't have a lot of the buy-in from another, a lot of the other stakeholders that need to be involved. So no matter how much incentives I think that you can really offer, would that really, really amount to a change, a paradigm shift in thought and behavior as it relates to the industry? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the other panelists a chance to Not answer that you question. Tell you but, but, but no, I think, no, 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 but I think that's part of the process. It, mm -hmm. It's not the whole entire process, but it's part of the process. Yeah, and again, it, it, we're going off topic a bit because mm -hmm. we need to have a, another discussion, I think. But it brings me back to the point that I was saying earlier. There's so much that needs to be, that we need to reassess, right, and reanalyze and review from a National Carnival Committee perspective, it cannot happen in three months. It cannot happen in four months. So if we want to truly enhance the Carnival product and take it to a, a regional and international stage, then I, I see this year as the perfect year to do that yes. in the midst of, of the pandemic because we now can say, okay, let us take a, a step back let us look at events that have not been so successful over the past few years. Let us look at events that are the, the main events surrounding the National Carnival Committee. Let us look at the fringe activities. Let us look at how we can partner with other ministries to enhance our product. So again, it takes us back to the point that I made earlier where this, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, these are the things that we can essentially look at and dissect and say, okay, well, this is how we're gonna do it for the 50th anniversary. We have a whole year to plan and this is how we're gonna do it. A month to month uh, assessment, meeting with key stakeholders from vendors to, to bands, to troops, etc. This is how we're gonna do it as a collaborative effort, not a you know, one man show. It's not about the National Carnival Committee. If you look at other islands, the National Carnival Committee has a very, very small role to play in Carnival, it is the private stakeholders 
people really are the force, the forces behind the national, the, the carnival celebrations. You don't see the shows, you don't see as much of the shows and of, uh, as much of the traditional aspects in other islands. So I think it is time for us to basically dissect our product, look at where we, we want to be in the next three to four years, and build on our our product over this year. Um, it is a time for reflection. As Banker said, I, I'm going to use his healing again. It is a time for us to heal, for us to reflect, and for us to really take into consideration what we have now and where we want to go. And as I said, the, 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 the carnival product for this year, 2020, we all know it is not going to be yeah. what we saw last year. There's absolutely no way we can have 10,000 people in, a street, in, in the streets for Juve or 10,000 people on the streets for Parade Day without any possibility of contact tracing, of testing temperatures, of hand sanitization, of keeping your six feet distance. <laughs> There's absolutely no way uh -huh. that these events can take place as we know them. However, as, as Dr. Wilkinson has said, our mental health is important as well, and we know that individuals want that type of social activity. So we need to come up with a plan, include our stakeholders, and say, okay, well, these are the, these are the events on the table. This is what we can have. These are what we cannot have. Um, these are events that are, there's absolutely no way, Patrice, that we can host. <laughs> But we can do some, we can start from a virtual, <laughs> we can start from a virtual point of view, we can start from a virtual aspect, and then we can build out on, on that. But at least we say, okay, well, these are the events that can go virtual, and we build out on that. And again, it all depends on the million dollar question when are we going to open our borders? Are we going to open our borders to individuals from hotspots? Are we going to be able to quarantine individuals when they come in? What is the risk involved? Because the health and the safety of the local individuals living in St. Kitts is, is paramount. Um, and we cannot, we cannot afford to put uh, any burden on the healthcare system because I will feel very guilty if, if we host a national carnival and insist on hosting a national carnival in its traditional, traditional form and then overwhelm our health, health system. We're in the last five minutes of this program, whether you believe it or not, we just have five minutes more. And I'm going to allow the panelists who, are, who have joined me this evening to provide some concluding remarks, especially as it relates to the overall topic. Can we reinvent the way we celebrate? And even if you want to, to give some input about the potential cancellation, because there are some persons who are indeed lobbying for that, or the, this, the use of limited persons at events or virtual events. So I'm going to allow the panelists to give some brief remarks as we wrap up this panel discussion. Yeah. Well, um, I want to thank everybody who joined um, tonight, and everybody who watched, everybody who listened. I think that there are probably lots of um, ideas out there on social media right now. And this is just the start of the conversation. Um, I can't imagine that this would be um, the only conversation. Um, but I think that, and I support Shannon in saying we can use 2020 as the year to um, reevaluate how how we do carnival in, in St. Kitts and hopefully um, for the 50th anniversary, we'll, we would have done so good at the virtual, some of the virtual events this year that when we incorporate the virtual and the physical, everybody in the world would know that there is a carnival in St. Kitts and it's called Sugar Mass. <laughs> I think, I, I think that is absolutely my sentiments. I think Carnival is a massive undertaking. It involves so many stakeholders over such a wide period, you know, from vendors to street cleaners to uh, participants in shows, event promoters, etc. It is a massive undertaking. And, I, and to build on what Monarch said, and as I said earlier, I think 2020 is our time to reassess where we are as the National Carnival Committee, reach out to our key stakeholders across the board 
get their feedback, get their input, put a plan in place on how we will move forward with the National Carnival, where we want to be in the next two to three years, and build on that product. Reach out to our, our, indiv our regional um, individuals who host carnivals. Build, you know, copy and paste. You know, see what is successful for them, get their feedback. Culturama, you understand? Copy and paste, get some feedback from Culturama as well, because Culturama, we've seen how it has grown successfully over the past few years. And I think this is, 2020 is our time to do that and support our stakeholders, ensure that their product is enhanced, goes to the market, see how we can you know, benefit as many stakeholders um, as possible. Well, um, what I can appreciate is that the conversations are now being had. Um, and that we're not waiting last minute to see what will happen, but we are being um, proactive in, in, in what we can make happen. Um, the approach has been, in my opinion, a significant one because while we are anticipating that we may be able to have one, we have a backup plan, which is the virtual. I don't believe that if we, if we are lobbying, if some people are lobbying for the, for the borders to be reopened so that we could have some economic stimulation from people coming in, then Carnival in its you know, own entirety is also a form of economic stimulation. So if, if we are lobbying for the borders to open, then I don't feel like we should have to delay our Carnival as a result of such entirely. We can still have something because if we don't have this year, which is 49, we can't call next year 50 because we didn't have a 49. So technically, we need to be able to have, it's the same thing for music festival. It's a bit more of an unfortunate situation for the festival, but Carnival, we have a chance. And uh, if we're going to have something, even if it's partially virtual, then I, I feel like we should be able to have something because it is a chance for us to, to um, uplift our emotional state of mind. After the, the hurricane had wiped out St. Martin, they had one of the best carnivals when they came back. And this is the opportune time for us to reinvent the wheel for carnival, improve on what has faltered, so to speak, and repackage and market our carnival for the world to know. Because if by December we are able to even have anything, the world is going to be looking at what we are doing. Because St. Kitts is having a carnival. And at the end of the day, we would have more marketing on our side because it's during this COVID time and everybody is looking to see what country is doing what. So we should be able to do something. We should be able to capitalize on the, um, the opportunity. As, as Shannon said, it's a silver lining and we can, we can take advantage of that. I hope that this is not the last of this type of discussion. I'm looking forward for more. So for the people that tuned in, we appreciate that, that you were here on my phone block with questions. I couldn't answer all of them. It's not the, you know, I'm not the only one here. Shannon, I see she's phone going crazy next to me. And um, <laughs> I do hope that we can return and, and provide questions um, to the NEOC while they are here with us and that we can also take maybe more questions from the listening audience, even audio, as long as we can keep it clean and, and, and recognize that we are all playing a part to make our carnival product better, bigger. And we were saying that during this time, I've seen the talk on social media that we need to find alternatives to just the regular tourism. So whether it is agriculture, entertainment, right, our carnival, um, it's not just about music festival being at the pinnacle, not knocking it because it's an amazing event and it brings um, economic stimulation, but our carnival should be on that level as well. And before I go, I want to thank ZIZ. I mean, ZIZ has been a partner of the St. Kitts Nevis National Carnival for time immemorial. So I want to thank ZIZ, the guys who are here at 10 o'clock in the night who put this amazing set together for us. Thank you so much ZIZ for continuing the partnership with the National Carnival Committee and helping us to get our message out uh, to the people of, of St. Kitts and Nevis. Thank you Shannon and thank you to all listening audience or viewers on Facebook, on social media, YouTube, wherever you are for staying with us. You're in luck because this is the first 
in a series of conversations and discussions that will surround the fret, our fret industry, entertainment industry, carnivals, you name it. We are happy that you were able to join us this evening. And as I will say, necessity is the mother of invention. And as we have looked at our partners in the Caribbean region and what they have been able to do successfully, I am confident that in St. Kitts and Nevis, we'll be able to have a grand time. We'll be able to have a event, an event that celebrates who we are as a people, our culture, and allows us to lift our mood and improve our economic status at the moment. So thank you for staying with us and have a great evening. <laughs>